we got to go to Uncle Dave Meltzer, and I think I may have figured this out. Do you remember, uh, Brian, are you old enough? Because I'm old enough, so I remember when it sounded like Dave actually enjoyed living. When it's when he when he spoke, it didn't sound like his best friend had just been run over by a fucking truck every time he opens his mouth, and he's like, well, I don't know. Yeah. I remember when he had enthusiasm, when he was an excitable young man. What's happened to Uncle Dave? I don't... I don't <sighs> <clears throat> anyway, uh, so this week in The Observer, I was the lead story, of course. Well, that's a safe shot every time since, you know, everybody's interested in me. Uh, but the one of the quotes, I just, I, I, it hurts me so bad to say this about Dave, but he has fallen into a trap to where in, in, when he first came around and in my era, all the old timers hated him because he was exposing the business. And of course, I don't like people that expose the business either, as we will talk about. <clears throat> but it wasn't like this was a guy in the business going to the newspapers and the magazines and saying wrestling's fake and blah, blah, blah. When I, when we, when I first met Dave, he was a guy doing a newsletter with a subscription base of what, maybe a thousand people. And you had to seek it out. You had to already be smart. You had to seek it out and subscribe to it. It was still technically somewhat of a, a closed society, the smart fans. And they honestly took care of the business a lot better than, than the regular fans back in those days because the smart fans didn't want to expose the business to the public. They just liked knowing what was going on and something they already knew about. And they would still, uh, as we've talked about, <clears throat> in some of the uh, WFIA conventions, the early days like that, the, the smart fans would beat around the bush and kind of interrogate people they didn't know to find out if they were smart so that they wouldn't say anything kayfabe around them if they weren't at the fan conventions. So this is how I came to know Dave. And so I didn't think he was being malicious. I thought he was providing a service for people that knew what was going on already and were seeking out some more information. Of course, this was before the explosion of the 90s where the promoters quit giving a shit and then the wrestlers quit giving a shit. And then all of a sudden, Dave's, you know, in front of 20,000 people instead of 1,000 and then he's on the internet to the blah, blah, blah. So I guess since I was there since the start, I didn't feel the same way as the old timers do, but now I think I know how they felt because the thing that I always respected about Dave was that he still respected the business. He wasn't exposing it to make mockery out of it. He was exposing it to cover it and to tell people that were interested what was going on in it. And most of the people interested that much were either in it, which is how I first saw the observer from Jimmy Garvin, bringing it to promos on a, a promo day at Crockett. <laughs> he called it the scandal sheet. Garvin did. And he said, and, and we were all like, boy, can you imagine if a general public got this? Thank fucking God. You know, right? But I guess since I knew it uh, from that point, as I said, Dave still had respect for the business. He would say about the ultimate warrior, this guy is the worst fa fucking wrestler in the world. And he would make fun of his matches while at the same, at the same time, you know, illustrating that, yes, obviously they were drawn because Vince McMahon was a fucking genius at mass hypnosis. They were selling a lot of tickets. He was making money, but he still acknowledged they, that he was the shittiest wrestler in the world. Now, my generation has passed also, as well as the previous generation, whereas the previous generation hated Dave and didn't want to talk to him, and my generation kind of grew up with him and, and got to know him, but he was still the guy coming to us for information. Now Dave's been around so long that to this generation of wrestlers, he's the fucking star and they're the little buddies. They hang around him because he's Yoda <clears throat> and they name move at, moves after him and they ask him for his opinion because that's the most important thing that matters to them. And also, I'm sure there's an element to some of the more manipulative ones of the sucking up and the, oh, Dave, you're fucking great. And now, 
as evidenced by the last time he was on our program, when I tried to get him to just to just this much, just say, Dave, you know the dick spot is fucking stupid and phony and offensive to people who have respect for the wrestling business. And as you'll recall, Brian, his fucking, the best we could get out of him was, well, it works for that audience, but it wouldn't play on TV, but it works for that audience. The Ultimate Warrior was working for that audience, but he was still honest and said the guy was the shits. But now that these guys have, <clears throat> I don't know, began to molly coddle poor Dave in his declining years, he it's not that he's going out of his way to, to uh, he's going out of his way to not hurt their feelings. It's not even professional journalism or whatever the fuck. He's going out of their way, out of his way to not hurt their feelings and to express shock that anybody couldn't see that wrestling has evolved because now guys use invisible hand grenades. So I've told him this and I still don't think he gets it because he still it says things like, well, the Young Bucks are just the modern Midnight Express. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not about they do too many moves. I don't care if they end up paralyzed. That's their stupid fault. These video game wrestling matches that don't make sense that are just one move after another and nobody sells anything. They're just phony and stupid, but they don't offend me. I just laugh at them. And if they want to do that, that's fine. But the invisible hand grenades... The invisible choke slams, the invisible man, the fucking mockery of obvious of legless people in the ring and the fucking tomfoolery of it and putting uh, wrestling on par with a Saturday Night Live sketch. That's offensive to me. That's disrespectful to me. <laughs> and much the same. Actually, they're worse than Eddie Mansfield because Eddie Mansfield was just a piece of shit that exposed the business to national television because he was a wannabe that couldn't get booked and couldn't get anywhere. And then later on, he said, I did it for the boys. Like they all do. Anybody says I did it for the boys. Actually, they did it for themselves and their own greedy interests. And then later on, they figured out a way that something happened that they could say, well, I can take credit for doing this for the boys, but they did it for themselves. But at least Eddie Mansfield didn't go out on a show in front of people and do shit with fucking levitation or voodoo, or fucking throwing people around with his dick, his little teeny tiny penis. These people are worse in my mind and more offensive to me than Eddie Mansfield because they were allowed into a business and then proceed to because they can only get over that way and no other way, mock it for being phony, make fun of it, make it stupid, and then create a segment of these modern, butthurt, pussy-needs-powdered fans that think that you are supposed to view professional wrestling as phony, silly, fake, and fun, and inclusive. Fuck you. That's the issue, Uncle Dave. Not that your fucking favorite wrestlers do too many high spots for me it's that they do too many high spots where they're phony fucking stupid children <laughs> whether it's you and, and and oh how can anybody not see that kenny olivier is the greatest wrestler in the world easy because he had a fucking match with a fucking sex toy and a nine-year-old girl and that removes him from consideration in my mind as a professional wrestler at all and 10 years later He's doing phony bench presses for comedy when he's supposed to be a main event wrestler on a billionaire's fucking program that they're bilking with their outlaw mud show brand of fucking sideshow bullshit. And they're giving it their friends a fucking job and they're fucking on his ticket, making sure that by the end of this year or six months or whatever the fuck, that no other television network will want to take a chance on that wrestling thing because, well, we proved that only Vince can do it right. That's what they're going to do, and that's what offends me, Dave. He actually said in The Observer, this could be the end of his career. Brian, was I doing NWA commentary, except on the, their anniversary pay-per-view last October of 2018, was I doing NWA commentary a year ago? No. 
<clears throat> was I doing MLW commentary a year ago? I don't believe so. I don't remember the dates, but I don't believe so. He is picked now to say this is the end of my career. When I, and let me, hold on. Let me, let me just do this also. The American Heritage Dictionary. I have it here rather than Merriam Webster or Rand McNally, just because this was my mom's actually. She liked to use it to do the crossword puzzles. So I keep it on my desk. Isn't that cheating? <clears throat> hey, are you accusing my mother of being a cheater? <laughs> just asking. I'm sorry. Career. A chosen pursuit, profession, or occupation. Uh, the general progress in one's working or professional life. Career. A chosen pursuit, profession, or occupation. I have not made professional wrestling. Pardon me, I was leaning over. My chosen pursuit, profession, or occupation since the end of 2012. It is a sideline to me as I went into the Jim Cornette business. And actually, as we have mentioned, the Jim Cornette business is more financially lucrative than the professional wrestling business was, at least for me. So, <clears throat> while I appreciate Dave being all worried and everything, this is not the end of my career because I don't consider myself in professional wrestling anymore and haven't for some time, which we'll discuss in a minute. But this is the other thing that he got me. He got me with. He said, well... I don't think he's going to go back to the NWA because obviously I'm not happy with everything that went on and it's a distraction now anyway. But he said, and any AEW deal is on life support at best at this point. <laughs> what the Brian help me at just talk for a minute so I can try to fucking just gather my thoughts. I could say that uh, an AEW deal was on life support uh, probably <laughs> since the beginning of AEW. Primarily because Jim Cornette had no interest in being involved with AEW. Well, and here's the thing. He admitted, and I listened to to some of his audio for the first time, because I've said I don't listen to my audio or anybody else's, but I listened to some of it. That's where I realized that he sounds like he just is just, he's just whooped anymore. But it, 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 when he said any, all of, I, I know he, in this audio, he said, well, I used to listen to Jim shows all the time, but he's just gotten so negative, gotten so, gotten so fucking truthful is what I've gotten. One of the things he said, he said, well, you know, his review of full gear, Emmy Sakura and Riho was a good match. Ah, uh. <clears throat> but the point I was making was while the fucking other guys are giving you Rhea Ripley versus Becky Lynch on free TV, and you're making me pay $50 to watch 20 something minutes of Japanese independent girls wrestling. Fuck you. It's my point I was making. What the fuck are they doing? I don't care if they have a good match or not at this point. They're structurally flawed, but he said he doesn't listen to me as much as he used to. So I can, I guess I can excuse all these comments because he doesn't know what the fuck's going on but as here is my exact 100 because this is like my therapy uh you know when i do the podcast brian you know i talk and i vent and it's therapy for me because i get my feelings out i know some of the listeners know this in bits and pieces but here from the start as quickly as possible is my exact thoughts of all elite wrestling I hear there's a billionaire that's going to run start a wrestling company okay i've heard that before but then i actually talk to the billionaire now they go, okay, this guy is, is legitimate and he does have a lot of money. And I'm obviously intrigued because why wouldn't you be? Then I find out who he wants to get in business with. And my enthusiasm is tempered greatly. But from that point to when they actually did something was like a year. And I felt, okay, I can be wrong. Maybe they can play it straight. Maybe this will be a fucking challenge to Vince or at least a positive product. I don't have a feeling that I want to fucking be around these people, but, and, and I am not in the wrestling business anymore. So I, the first thing that I said to Tony Khan, <clears throat> when I spoke to him the very first time was I'm the only person going to tell you the truth because I don't want a job. So it was never about getting a job. It was about being affiliated or involved in some respect if I wanted to be and if they wanted me to be when they started running. But by the time they started running and we saw the battle royal with the legless man and Jojo, the dog face boy and whoever the fuck else was in it, 
I realized that my first inclination was correct and that they couldn't be serious and that they couldn't fucking run a goddamn wrestling promotion without making it a clown show, except for Cody and Jericho. But in the back of my mind, I did see, you know, as a performer, Brian, you know, as, as, as you know me very well, the thought that I could at one point walk out in front of 10,000 of those people and hear that reaction and know that they genuinely despise me because they know I feel the same way about them. That would be heat that you hadn't felt since the eighties. And for that experience, I was willing to say at that point, you know, if the revival got free and it could be a situation where I could do three or four TV tapings leading up to a pay-per-view, then that would be fun. But as I've seen all the other shit that they've done since then, that pulling the plug works both ways. And I pulled the plug in my mind because I would just be forsaking my principles to justify, even to help the revival and have some fun. I would be, my principles would be shot to hell if I justified any of this continued bullshit that I've seen from them since then. So that has been out of my mind. And I have had no comp contact with them since. And I assume they don't want me around because they know what I think of them. As you can tell, I'm crying about this. But I guess the, the tone of Dave's comments and column, I guess it boils down to why do all these people, Brian, insist that I take jobs that I don't want to work with people that I don't like to not be able to say things that I want to say just to be, to make themselves happy and make me miserable. Why are they not content until that I, they they always want me when well, he can't get a job. I'm not looking for one. Then if I take one, they're not happy about that either. What's a boy to do? <clears throat> I don't know what else to tell them. So anyway, I thought we would go back. I don't, I, I mean, what, what is this a conundrum? They're not happy unless I have a job, in which case if it was a regular job, I wouldn't be happy. But they are happy when I, when I take a job and then, and then, and then blow up and, and leave or whatever the fuck. Can we, how do we make these people happy? Can I ask you a question though, real quick about the observer coverage? Cause I read the story, Please do. the, uh, the obituary to Jim Cornette and it, it seemed to me that there was some stuff in there about the NWA situation that would clearly have been fed to Dave from, let's just say someone with the NWA. Had, did, I'm not trying to go knocking another uh, company. And that's not what I'm doing. All right. Did Dave contact you? Did Dave contact you for the story? You, you and I haven't talked no. about this for anyone one. No, I, I really no. He he listened to the show. <laughs> Is that what he did for the story? He listened to our show that we did. That was and and talked to whoever he talked to on the other side. I have no idea. He didn't. Well, I, I wouldn't have. I would not have said anything differently to Dave Meltzer on the phone, as I said on the podcast. So he got the story. He just chose to overlook it. What about the, the whole thing though, that the NWA were upset that you're so negative. And that's the quote. I'm not saying it, you know, cause I think people overlook all the fair stuff you say about AEW, that it was negatively affecting them. I mean, it's not like this is new. It's not like you weren't, even before Dynamite, you weren't talking about all this. Yeah, no, this was, this is not new, obviously. This is, the NWA is newer than my feelings on the fucking, you know, fine feathered friends at All Elite Wrestling. And the only person with the NWA that had ever said anything was Dave Lagana, who said, you know, we get 27% of our viewers on YouTube from AEW Dark. I don't know how that works, and I don't give a shit. Nobody asked me to change my opinions. They asked me to come in and announce a wrestling show, which is what I did. <clears throat> and I didn't mention the opposition on the air, except every once in a while I say, you know, these are actually grown men, but that could apply to a lot of promotions these days and not cosplay wrestlers. And that applies to m many more independent shows than all elite wrestling. Uh, but otherwise, no, you know, I was not asked to change, nor would I have changed the podcast for, I, I am not going to change my full-time work 
for my part-time work. And I'm not downing the NWA. I'm downing my interest in pro wrestling on a regular or even semi-regular basis as a whole. I did the NWA thing because I have the history with the NWA. I like doing studio wrestling. It was once every two months, and Atlanta ain't that far away. If it had been even once a month, I would have definitely asked for more money to make the trip and probably been pissed because I don't want to fucking travel that often. And if, it, if, if anything came up to where the show became a weekly event, I'd be out to begin with, unless they're shooting it in fucking Louisville. And the, it was the same issue, and we'll, we'll go ahead and go here in the, in, into my backstory. With MLW, I bailed Cord out of a pinch when he lost access to Shivani for a while in the, the WrestleMania weekend in New York and a couple shows in Chicago and Milwaukee because that's even closer to me than Atlanta. At one point, we were talking about trying to get... I told him after the first New York, and I believe I said this on the air, I'm retired from New York City the week after I got back. That trip almost killed me. And at one point, we were trying to figure out a way to get me to Dallas, which is 900 miles, because I didn't want to leave them stuck without an announcer or whatever with the Von Erichs debut in Dallas. We tried to put it together an extra meet and greet or whatever. I wasn't going to go for the same thing I go to Chicago for. Couldn't. Um, and then finally they got a backup plan put together with Shivani for a while. I don't know what's going on there. And that was fine. Um, but I'm not interested in any ongoing full-time involvement in a professional wrestling organization of any kind, because I'm interested in living longer. And if I got involved in wrestling business again, especially today, I would probably have a fucking stroke. 